Hello, viewers. Today I'm interviewing Mr. Patrick Suckling, the High Commissioner of Australia in India. Thank you, sir, for giving us time. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity. And it was a real pleasure listening to your speech yesterday. Mm -hmm. You have really bowled most of the Indians, at least you bowled me completely. Yes. And uh, how, did you, how do you know so much about India? I know you're a High Commissioner, you get the briefings, but your knowledge on India from the speech I heard yesterday is yes. exceptional. Mm. What is the, uh, how do you know about India so well? Well, I have a long association with India, going back, in fact, to childhood, but certainly from university days, I used to go and visit India pretty much every year for my end of year holidays. So I spent a lot of time traveling around India independently as a backpacker, as so many Australians do. So I developed a, an interest and a fondness and an appreciation for the depth, the breadth and the diversity of India during those years. And then my interest grew because of all of that exposure. So then when I was finishing different bits and pieces of study at university, I ended up doing an honours thesis in English literature on Indian writers, displaced Indian writers, Salman Rushdie and B.S. Naipaul actually. Um, but I'd also done some courses on Indian writers as well. And then I did an economics honours thesis on India-Australia trade relations. And uh, then I went on to do a postgraduate diploma in Hindi because I thought if I have such an interest in this country I should um, bother to learn the language. So from my own um, interests, I suppose, I developed more of an understanding of, of India and then professionally when I joined the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade I was put on the South Asia desk of which I was looking after or helping look after as a very junior person the India relationship. But then I've been working on India in many different ways and guises ever since then, whether it's on, I think I've worked on every major study, every major Australia-India study that the department's ever done, I've had some association with. Um, I was posted to India in the mid-90s, so then I professionally had to work on India, particularly on politics and on foreign policy out of New Delhi, but also on social issues and human rights issues. And, um, and beyond that, then um, in, in the United States, when I was posted there, I worked very closely with the Ameri American administration on the 123 agreement from an Australian perspective, which was a big strategic reorientation from, uh, from the United States towards India. And then uh, latterly worked with, the, with Prime Minister Rudd on the strategic partnership for India that we, we announced in 2009. I worked with Prime Minister Julia Gillard on changing the policy on uranium which she took uh, on elements of her party to, to ensure happened. And then, as you know, I've been High Commissioner in India for the last two years. So that's uh, an association with India that goes back decades. Post Mr. Modi's visit, the first Prime Minister in 28 years to Australia, uh, what significant polit political shift uh, in Canberra has happened after his visit to, to Australia? I would say there's been a political intensification, an intensification at the political level in both sides of politics in Australia in strengthening our relationship with India. And I think Mr Modi's visit significantly accelerated and intensified that shift, which has been occurring for many years uh, between Australia and India. Our relationship has been strengthening for a long time. And over the past decade, we've come a long way in our relationship. But I think Mr Modi's visit to Australia, as you say, the first visit by an Indian Prime Minister in 28 years was a real exclamation mark. It was a really solid demonstration of Mr Modi's interest in Australia for, for, for reasons that um, have to do with India's economic growth, economic development and also India's strategic and security environment. And so Mr Modi sees Australia as a very strong partner for India, just as our Prime Minister, Mr Abbott, sees India is a very strong partner for us. And so I think Mr Modi's visit's given further impetus to a momentum that was building and has been building for quite some time. But he certainly has created a great sense of excitement and enthusiasm about India. And one of the interesting things about me being back in Australia at this time, following Mr Modi's visit of a few months ago, is how noticeable that enthusiasm is, not only in the political context in Australia, but also among corporate business people in Australia and also everyday people. So there's a real sense of um, India's moment has come with Australia and vice versa. And so I think as our Foreign Secretary puts it, Australia and India are currently in a sweet spot. Now, there's a potential of Indo-Australian uh, cooperation in all sectors, infrastructure, mining, etc. However, the trade between Australia and India is not to that level. 
have you had an interaction with current government in India to identify the areas of cooperation and business? Yes, we've had extensive and intensive interaction with the government of India at the moment and in previous governments as well in terms of where we can strengthen the economic relationship. As Mr Modi very nicely put it to our parliament when he spoke to our parliament and he was the first Indian Prime Minister ever to address an Australian parliament, which is a great honour and privilege for us and he gave a fantastic speech and one of the memorable lines in, in that speech, there were two actually, one was um, that for too long India has been on the periphery of India's vision and should now become the, at the centre of India's thoughts. And the second thing that he said that has remained with me, among, any, among many other things, was that um, in every area of national priority for his government, he sees Australia as being a major partner. So in that context, there is a recognition that we have some core strengths in Australia, economic strengths, that can contribute to his agenda for growth and development and transformation of India. And if I could just mention four. One is energy and security, mining, and India needs energy security. We have companies, we have resources, we have expertise, we have supplies. India is looking to us as a long-term secure supplier of things like coal, LNG, uranium. So there's the energy security relationship. Education and skills is another area. India needs to train 500 million people by 2022. It sees Australia as a, a strong proven partner in that area. There's agriculture. India is going through a successive series of green revolutions. The next will bring significantly more modernity to the entire food chain, agribusiness chain in India. We're seeing as a leading player in agriculture. Infrastructure is another area. Mr Modi wants to invest $1.3 trillion over the next few years in huge infrastructure investments in India, but that's just the tip of the iceberg because he wants to build 100 new cities in India over 50 years connect India through heavy rail transit corridors, build special economic zones, build transport hubs, build new ports, airports, roads, bridges, tunnels, you name it, India needs to build it. So India is looking at our capabilities and our money, our pension funds, for example, have the third largest funds under management anywhere in the world at $2, two trillion. That'll be up to $7 trillion by 2030. So we're conscious of those strengths. Mr Modi is very conscious of those strengths. Going the other way, India has all sorts of expertise that Australia will, would welcome in our country. For example, there are some significant investments from India in our resources sector, bringing Indian capabilities to, to the Australian resources sector. The top five IT companies in India are all in Australia, let alone all sorts of other IT companies, but those five were three or four for their global revenues, which is not insignificant. They employ thousands of Australians and um, they're bringing world's best practice in IT to Australia. There's some fantastic Indian manufacturing companies like Tata, like Mahindra, who are coming to Australia and investing in Australian manufacturing in uh, aircraft company, for example, lately. And there are pharmaceuticals companies, there are agribusiness companies, there are health companies from India looking to invest in Australia. So that's one of the strong messages that we give to the Australian business community and the Australian people more broadly is India has a lot of sophisticated companies doing extraordinary things at a world-class level and many of them are now coming to Australia. So we have these discussions with Mr Modi. As you know, Mr Abbott's very focused on economic diplomacy as a central part of foreign policy. Mr Modi is exactly the same. And because we have these synergies, these areas of um, complementarity between our two countries, there's enormous economic scope to do more, and that's why we've agreed, the Prime Minister's agreed last year to, to negotiate an FTA agreement by the end of this year, which would be a very significant further diversification of an already strong trading and uh, investment relationship. So it's a, it's a very fundamental part of how we engage with one another, including at the highest level. Yesterday I heard you telling there are 50,000 students from India and it's growing yes. at the rate of 15% every yes. year. Uh, is there any thought about any university setting up a campus back in India uh, to support that bulk of people who are not able to come here but need that quality education like yes. what you have done, uh, Wollongong University has done in Dubai. Yes. You have a campus there. Mm. Uh, Healthcare, because I belong to that industry, because yes. that's what I have been doing for 25 years. Uh -huh. Also, uh, hospital, the public system we have here. This is, I think, the world top class public hospital system in the world. Yes. 
and uh, which India lacks very much, the public system, where I think they should be taking help of the Australian Health Department and doing things. That's my personal perception yes. because I'm from that area, so mm -hmm. I think so. Yeah. Uh, these are the areas. Any thought on setting up campuses there by any university or they just want the kids to come here? Yes. I think going to your point of that being your area, you know, one of the exciting things about our relationship, is it doesn't really matter what area you looked at, I named four core areas of strength that Australia has, but there are so many areas between our two economies, our countries, where there are enormous opportunities. Health is, is an extraordinarily good example of the opportunities that exist between Australia and India. India is building world-class health capabilities in the private sector and also to a degree in the public sector. And um, that's seeing billion dollars of investment across the spectrum, and uh, we're recognised again as a as a world class provider of healthcare services. So that's another area. In terms of education, we have 20 of our universities, of our 40 odd universities, are already in one way or, an act or another active with India. Some have been there for 20 years already, and that's partly why the numbers of students coming to Australia are so strong. The Indian policy settings at the moment don't allow for an Australian university to go and set up in India. Uh, a lot of our universities wish that those policy settings would change so that they could do that and I understand a longer term plan of the Modi government might be to see some liberalisation of the education sector in India. At the moment there's certainly a lot more flexibility coming to the Indian marketplace in terms of people being able to come to India and study courses, get credited for that course back into their degree in Australia so it's, in, it's allowing more exchanges between our students and that's a very positive thing and the student exchanges are growing rapidly but it, I think we're a little bit away off from a whole university from Australia being able to set up in India because of current policy constraints in India but some of our universities would definitely love to do that. Does Tony Abbott government have any concern that New Delhi has to address? As I, say, as I was saying at the beginning of the interview I think our relationship is in a sweet spot and so I think the concern really on both sides of, of the fence is um, what more can we do to make the most of the extraordinary enthusiasm, the interest between our two countries in terms of the economic interests, the geostrategic, the strategic and security interests that we have in continued stability and prosperity in the, in the Indo-Pacific region. Those are the sorts of preoccupations of our Prime Minister that they're at the moment touch wood and no real irritants between our two countries. Uh, we're, we're, we're full of enthusiasm for one another. We have deep connections, historic connections. Our peoples, in many fundamental ways, just click. They get each other. We have a lot of shared DNA, whether it's through the shared political systems that we inherited um, as a legacy of empire in very different ways. But nevertheless, we have um, federal systems of government, similar, le similar legal systems, up to a point similar language of English, which is a great unifying thing in India. Um, we have all sorts of other institutions as well as sport and cricket that bind our two peoples together. And so I think from Mr Modi's perspective and certainly from our Prime Minister's perspective, making the most of that and taking our relationship to a much higher level is really what they're focused on because there really aren't at the moment any impediments, any real problems between our two countries. Although we, like India, and looking at the sort of environment for business to operate in India. Mr Modi's got a very strong reform agenda. We're very encouraged by what he's done to date in terms of running a reform agenda. Mr Abbott's got a reform agenda in Australia, but both countries have an interest in seeing the reform agenda maxim maximised and we keep talking to each other on that basis. The nuclear deal is a big leap in friendship between Australia yes. and India. And the FTA, you said, was coming soon. And mm. Mr. Modi has put a deadline here, 2015. That's December. right. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I think, do you think it will happen by that time? Both prime ministers are strongly and publicly committed to concluding an FTA by the end of this year. So we're giving it a red hot go. Our negotiators have met already. They were talking this week by teleconference. They're talking again on Friday by video conference. They'll be meeting with one another on mass in a couple more weeks' time. And so there is a sincere and earnest and intensive effort to meet this deadline. It's an ambitious deadline, but both Prime Ministers have said they're up for it and we're going to do our level best to meet their expectations. Obama, uh, Mr. <laughs> President Obama is always taking Indo-American community to strengthen the relationship between America and, and India. Yes. Uh, will Canberra be looking at Indian expatriate in this country for 
to enhance the relationship between Australia yeah. and India? Yes, of course we will. I mean, one of the greatest treasures and assets we have in terms of our relationship with India is the people of India who come and made their lives in Australia and contributed in such significant ways to build the community and the wealth and the prosperity of Australia. And from our perspective, that's an invaluable asset to draw from. And Mr Abbott, our Prime Minister and our government's very focused on how can we work with the Indian communities. And as you know, the Premier of New South Wales is doing exactly the same thing. And one of the more noticeable things of uh, the relationship in recent years is just how many Indian-related events are being organised by the Indian communities in Australia. Uh, whether it was the Festival of India in New South Wales, whether it's the Film Festival in Melbourne, whether it's the cricket. I mean, everyone was, has been talking about the atmosphere uh, that was uh, seen at the cricket in, in Adelaide between India and Pakistan and also between India and South Africa. But it, 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 it's across all areas of, of our communities. It's not only sport, it's education, it's science and technology, it's business, anywhere that you look nowadays and that's one of the great greatly encouraging things and one of the nice things of being High Commissioner at the moment is that it um, doesn't matter where I go in Australia, it doesn't matter where I go in India, I can go to the farthest flung part of what I would have thought to be India and you will find someone who's doing something or who knows something about an Australian or is doing something together and that's what I was saying in that speech the other night. I mean on the one hand one, the load bearing pillar of our relationship is economics and commerce and that's going very strongly. We have a growing pillar in terms of our strategic and our security cooperation because of the changing strategic dynamic in the Indo-Pacific. But we also have a third pillar, which is our people-to-people -people pillar. And um, because our people click, because they have, in my view, many similar and shared DNA because of our heritage and in different ways, I think um, the, the potential and the opportunity for our peoples to do more together is greater than it's ever been and given the flows between our two countries, between our two peoples, that potential will just get stronger and stronger and therefore I think at a state level and a federal level, governments in Australia are working and, and have already been seen to be working to make the most of those community links and they're a very, very powerful driver of the relationship. This year is a hundred year of Gallipoli. Thousands, thousands of Indians have died alongside Australian, and yes. this is a known fact now. Yes. Uh, do you think the both countries should embark in building their relationship in defence and other areas? We are doing that, and we and we we recognise and we commemorate, especially in this hundredth year of Gallipoli, the sacrifice and the service of so many Indian soldiers who fought in those wars. And one of the things that our Prime Minister did when he came to India was he insisted that he visit the, the, India, the India Gate in Delhi, which is the commemorative gate for all of the wars that Indian troops have fought in. And he asked for specifically the three services of the Indian military to be present in numbers, to have a special ceremony to commemorate and to profile the contribution, the extraordinary contribution that the Indian military made in both the First World War and the Second World War. And he laid a wreath. And that was a very significant event because it was for the first time ever we were told by Indian protocol that such a commemorative service by a foreign leader had been, had ever happened in India. I mean, some people have laid wreaths there before, but not with, there were around 300 Indian service people there. And um, when Prime Minister Modi came to Australia, he brought with him a silver statue of a Sikh grenadier throwing a grenade, I think, that he brought to the War Memorial in Canberra as a sign of um, his recognition of the links between our two. There are a lot of Indian sharpshooters who were sh uh, helping through their sharpshooting our forces trying to get off the boats in Gallipoli. There's a lot of mention of the efforts that the Indian soldiers made at Gallipoli in, in, in um, concert with our forces in that campaign. So there are books being written this year that are trying to give a much stronger, deeper sense of the links between our two militaries. There are exhibitions that are also going to happen this year. We've invited a significant contingent of Indian military to Gallipoli to help us commemorate this 100th anniversary in, in Gallipoli. So I think um, we've made a real effort this year, our Prime Minister has, and Mr Modi has reciprocated that effort, which is a big thing, because um, there's been a bit of ambivalence in India about whether to celebrate 
the soldiers of the First World War and the Second World War because they were fighting for empire. And I think that there's a sense in India that those soldiers did their service and made their sacrifices in the spirit of all great military service and that should be properly recognised and commemorated. And Mr Modi's making efforts to do that and he certainly did that when he came to Australia. And so um, we have a history and uh, we have converging, as I was saying, strategic interests now which are driving much stronger defence cooperation. So during my time in India, under the Congress government, for the first time ever an Indian defence minister came to Australia and uh, when he was here we agreed to do Navy to Navy exercising regularly in a serious way which has never been done between our two navies before. But there's also interest in doing all sorts of other things together with our militaries because we have shared interest in the continued stability and prosperity of this region. I mean people talk in a shorthand way of this being the Asian century and what that really means from our perspective is, is that the centre of economic and strategic gravity is shifting to the Indo-Pacific. India is right smack bang in the middle of that dynamic and that strategic framework and so for us working more closely with India on stability and security issues including on counter-terrorism and Mr Modi has been very strong in his condemnation of terrorism in recent months is something that we see great scope for and a great future to do more together with for the benefit of not only both our peoples but the people of this region in general so yes we'll be doing a lot more with India in these areas. And I was very happy that yesterday when you said all the visas are generally done in a very short time period in Delhi. That's right, record. yes. Mm -hmm. And I should thank you, Anupam Sharma, who is who's the maker of the film Un-Indian, yes. where Brett Lee is the hero, has yes. thanked you especially because oh, you have you. really helped him in mm -hmm. getting visas on time for yes. the artists to come and do the shoot here. Yes. And thank you very much, sir, for giving us time. No, that's and a great pleasure. And I wish you all the best. You're the first bureaucrat I've seen who knows India's in and out. And that has really bowled me, as I told you, David. Thank you very much, sir. No, it's a pleasure. Well, they say it takes a lifetime to learn anything about India, and I'm not even a quarter of my way through that lifetime in terms of 20 years of work experience and knowledge of India. So it does, India is a vastly complex but rich and rewarding country. It's an amazing country and it's a privilege to serve as the High Commissioner to India. Thank you for bringing both the countries closer. Thank, Thank you, you. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, sir.